anywhere, but I've been asked to um, to attach this device to you if you're going to read in your seat. Oh, um, all right. Well, which, so which do you prefer? Oh, oh okay. Okay, yeah. so I'll just leave that to you to attach that to your lapel in a comfortable sure. spot. Thank you so much for the invitation, uh, first of all. It's such a pleasure to, to be here and to, uh, and, and, and to be here to talk about truth, I, I think, is really interesting. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I think this is not a topic that I get to address very often in my work. Um, but it's a topic that I, I, want, I want to address all the time, uh, even as a, as a writer of of poetry, I think, uh, you know, the, 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 the work that I'm, I'm speaking to is very often, uh, like, in, in dialogue, at least, with, uh, with issues in indigeneity and, uh, and colonialism. Um, the, the piece that I, the piece I really wanted to read for you today is a piece from uh, my a, a current work in progress, um, and and if you're familiar with all of my work, or if you're familiar with my other work, uh, you'll know that a, a, a lot of the writing that I do um, comes from a place, or it, like it tends to begin kind of at a at a point that looks like um, conceptualism sometimes, uh, and in this case, it's kind of uh, an impure conceptualism. Uh, so this project is. Uh, is built out of um, descriptions of land and landscape from James Fenimore Cooper's Last of the Mohicans, uh, but it's also, but the 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 actual writing process uh, was taking out all of those descriptions of land and and rewriting them and writing over them and writing through them. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll read you read you this short piece. A deep, narrow chasm, black rocks. The river lies still on those black rocks. A mile above, there is a tumbling. There is a moment. At this very moment, there is a tumbling in the air a mile above us that runs straight through the open heavens and into some other place. A deep hollow, no shape, no consistency, no breaking some hundred feet in the air. Some places are softer than others, some hundred feet up in the air. Some right angles enter into narrow passageways, and some right angles break off a mile in the air above us. These rocks are full of cracks. Water has worked through some deep hollows, breaking here, wearing there, breaking and wearing until the chasm separates into two caverns. Some hundred feet in the air, there is no danger. There is scattered driftwood and the scent of roses. There are glimpses of roses and rocks and shrubs. There is a steep, rugged ascent, a path that winds among the black rocks and trees. Somewhere in the air, there is the scent of roses. Somewhere out there is the wilderness, a reasonable distance through scenes of greenery and nature and glimpses of mountain ranges that disappear just as suddenly as they appear. Among the rocks and trees, there are mounds of earth and other rocks and other driftwood. Somewhere there is an islet and another islet and a clear sheet of water and bald rocks just beneath the surface. There are forests and straits and islets and rocks and somewhere in the air is the scent of roses. There are crevices and fissures and rocks. The rocks surround themselves in other rocks, although there are sometimes mounds of earth in between. On the shore, there are fragments of rocks. In the deeper parts of the river, there is more tumbling. At this very moment, the river pours into a wide fissure where it just becomes more water between rocks. 
Between the broken rocks and the deep roaring cavern, there is the scent of roses and driftwood and trees. There is light and straight naked rocks and immovable trees. There are woods and rivers, and the bed of that river is ragged with rocks and intersecting ravines that cut silently across the water above, where somewhere in the air is the scent of roses. The woods are full of sounds and rocks. The woods are full. The upper air, where it drifts over the tops of trees, is full of sounds. Just where it breaks over the tops of trees, there are slow, intermingling drifts of sounds and scents that brush over the clearing some 50 or 60 feet up in the air. Rocks and logs and mounds of earth and narrow fissures and bottom land and little ponds and a brook that shoots through the narrow fissures, spreading through moment after moment of stretched light. There is a bellowing in the passageways between the rocks. There are moments of admonished madness. There are moments spreading over the acres of bottom lands. There are precipices and adjacent lakes and headwaters. There is a fierceness here that floats through the water. And I will probably stop there. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>
Canada had taken us in after the coup in Chile five years earlier, but my mother had made it clear from day one that the refugee thing in the imperialist north was not for us. So our suitcases had been packed again, and our posters of Ho Chi Minh, Salvador Allende, and Tupac Amaru taken down and given away. Rulo drove us to the airport in my mother's orange VW bug, and Mummy had several attacks of the giggles along the way because he'd only just learned to drive. Clutch, Rulo, clutch, you idiot, she yelled. I'd never seen Rulo so excited, and I knew it was because he'd get to keep the car from that day on. This part of the imperialist north, LAX, was very different from anything I'd seen so far. In Vancouver, we and the few dozen other Chilean families had been the only Latinos. That city, where you could buy tropical fruit in the dead of winter, was full of white people who kept their bodies and faces perfectly still when they talked. <laughs> At LAX, we were surrounded by the sound of Mexican Spanish, and there were black people everywhere. I could see palm trees and turquoise sky just beyond the walls, the glass walls of the airport. The lady who'd sold me a cheeseburger with no patty, I'd been a strict vegetarian since I was eight, had touched my cheek and spoken to me in Spanish. She'd recognized herself in me, and somehow I understood that. For the first time in five years, I thought maybe I belonged somewhere, but it couldn't possibly be here because the North was the forbidden place of belonging. I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Pardon? Thank you. Um, you have very soothing voices, both of you. <laughs> um, I read on, on Tuesday, so I, I talked also. So I'm, this time I'm just going to talk. Um, when this uh, theme of uh, when does fiction become true was, was put to me, I started like going through kind of my ca catalog of projects to see how it would fit. And also I looked a bit at, at, at both your works. And you know, I've only known for two days that for a few days that we're, we're going to speak together. So I tried to find something that, uh, that could possibly resonate. 2010, I was invited by the City of Montreal as an artistic organization, <laughs> along with two other artistic organizations, even though I was working alone and putting together the team, to create a, a sort of a, a thematic project around a neighborhood in Montreal where there was a lot of immigration. It's actually uh, the most diverse culturally, uh, the neighborhood that's the most diverse culturally in Canada, it's called Park Extension. It used to be a Greek neighborhood. Before that, it used to be a train yard. And uh, that's where uh, Mr. Van Horn of Canadian Pacific uh, fame or folly uh, built his palace to, uh, to the train. And one of the, the big train stations that was in Montreal, which is now a subway station called the on the blue line, which closes very early and nobody seems to use, called Park. And I decided I would create a country uh, <laughs> because I had this opportunity to invest uh, the, you know, the neighborhood, to conquer it. And um, I found a statue of a fish inside the sta station, which used to be a water fountain. It seemed to have landed there and kind of lodged itself in the wall like a fossil. And I decided that this country should be called Pacifica, which is, of course, a name for peace. And um, one thing you found in this neighborhood, because it was multicultural, was a lot of police leaflets mm -hmm. about uh, if your daughter is going out with a guy named Slim, you should call the authorities. <laughs> and uh, when you look at the statistics for this neighborhood, it's actually one of the least criminalized in uh, the country. And in the city, it's one of the it's one with the least crime rate. And so. Um, they put me in touch with uh, French immersion classes, because when people get to Quebec, they have to learn French. 
uh, as soon as they arrived. So this was a class filled with people of very different ages. Often the kids do better than the adults who are already ensconced in their uh, adult language. And um, the project had to be uh, done through mediation with this group. So I said I will involve them into the life of my fiction in a certain sense, and I will try to get closer to their own life as immigrants and the stories that they, uh, they carried with them. And since there were all these ads for uh, keeping teenage uh, girls out of the reach of uh, rap musicians, um, I decided I would, I would, um, I I would follow um, the, the inspit of Nabokov to write uh, <laughs> the entrance song into the land of Pacifica. So I wrote this, this little text, Pa, Paci, Pacifica, Pacifica, Pays perdu, Marie Muette, Mon âme, mon nom, pacifica, ton nom houle, roucoule, déferle le long de ma langue pour se déverser enfin dehors, pacifica. And uh, I'll let you reread the beginning of uh, Lolita at some other point. <laughs> and um, I thought uh, that Pacifica was this mute country that was kind of faded into the neighborhood. And I wanted to give access, I wanted a country that was as simple to access as taking a train ticket, going somewhere. So your passport would be the train ticket itself. And I decided to make the metro station into the palace of this, uh, of this country. So we built these gobos and uh, projected this film for a month and a half, uh, which was filmed inside the Windsor train station, uh, which was rented to me by um, a real estate development company who took almost half the budget for the whole production <laughs> in order to rent a place uh, to film inside the train station. So this inaccessible kind of image of the place of arrival. And uh, it, 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 this is next to a grocery store, hundreds of people, and it's Joe Fresh occupies the building <laughs> also. So I had to deal with the, the clothes selling authorities. It was very cold that night, we drank tea. And the citizens of Pacifica, this is a sampling of them. They, they tended to be very silent during the workshops, but everybody involved themselves in writing. And there were a lot of smiles. There were also people who refused to participate because it reminded them too much of immigration and political procedures that they'd had to suffer uh, before coming into Canada. I set up an imaginary uh, immigration control in their uh, classroom. And basically, uh, all you needed was a train ticket to become a citizen. And uh, I gave them access to the country during uh, the month of September 2010, which is a very useful month because it does not exist and kind of slips between October, uh, sorry, October and November. And uh, I made, uh, with the help of Studio Feed, this graphic design uh, firm that I often uh, work with, a series of, of uh, immigration uh, procedures. And this is the passport photograph, true to life here. So people just had to draw themselves, and then I used this material to create the art installation. This is a, a mute map of the neighborhood. I rename all the, the surrounding streets. It's only 2.3 kilometers, and there's 26 languages spoken there. And uh, so, for example, on the right, you see the unoccupied territories. And um, I asked them to locate uh, from memory places that existed within their mindscape. Most people could pinpoint where McDonald's war was, <laughs> but for the rest, it, it all grew a little bit confused. And then these sentimental procedures uh, were extended uh, by a workshop where I asked them to come to the workshop with an object that they carried with them during their immigration procedures, which was then hidden in a, in a brown lunch bag and distributed to the others in the classroom. And I asked other people to imagine the story of these objects. So you had a crucifix, for example, in this case. I think she's, she was Colombian, if I remember correctly. And it, it held very profound meaning for her because it gave her hope during the crossing. But then people would make up these fictions, and we had the person who brought the object reveal the true story of the object. And then we'd measure the distance between this, this starting point as the, and this end point. And often the echoes uh, were very close between uh, fiction and uh, documentary. And then I built this, um, this board, basically, which I call the Table of Departures, which is also the title of the project, and installed it within the Windsor train station and built a narrative that's very close to uh, the story of Roadrunner and uh, the Coyote. 
This is basically that you have a man who wants to keep order, who is called the controller, who is in charge of the train station of the Pacifico Palace, and the eraser is his uh, life sworn enemy. This is a controller, he's very serious. <laughs> and uh, this is the eraser. He's <laughs> up, up to no good. And they chased each other within this, uh, this landscape of the train station. This is what you saw through the windows of the palace every day. And he grew more and more frustrated <laughs> and, and started to try to develop uh, methods for communicating silently with the public and public space. So he used telegraph, he used uh, silent, uh, uh, sign language, and this, he would turn towards the camera and start trying to communicate with people in the public space throughout the film that's projected in the middle window. And um, on the, yes, he's very proud of himself. He's holding a fish in newsprint be, behind his, uh, under his arm, which was the symbol of uh, the country. But uh, basically in the scenario, he just drops the objects that uh, the citizens of Pacifica took with them and the controller tries to classify them and he tries to create as much chaos as possible and you can see here he's got these weapons which are these two uh, old style erasers so every time the controller writes something on the board he comes and erases it <laughs> and it's kind of in the aesthetic of a silent movie this is the kind of stuff that the, the eraser leaves lying about it's tank um, and then I, I uh, kind of uh, took all these materials and I put them all on this web page which is still on, which is le tableau de départ.com, which is very easy to get these URLs because they're in French. And, um, and, and we did this, uh, created this, this website that's kind of like structured like a table of departure where all the fictional content meets literary content, which is a, a literary text about Pacifica, which starts with these words which I read to you. Also, this typeface was developed for it, Le Tableau de Départ, which is actually inspired by the actual table of departures, the actual board of departures that was within this space, because the father of one of the graphic designers had worked in dismantling the space for civic use. And here you have the archive of uh, absolutely all their participation. You have a Twitter page with a video of the pigeons that hang out around the uh, train station because it's Twitter, so it's all about birds talking. <laughs> and uh, you have also a comparison between countries of origins and neighborhoods of arrival uh, here on the top left corner, which were um, made into, s into slides and allowed us to create a compound map of Pacifica, which is this very clear archipel where everybody is welcome to lead their lives, their future lives. So this was kind of, um, I'll conclude on this. Uh, les oiseaux de Pacifica ne parlent aucune langue, ils les chantent toutes. The birds of Pacifica speak no particular language, they sing them all. There you go. Just 
dismantle that and to reveal a certain nakedness in order to be true. Can I yes. say that? Yes. And I'm just curious about both that process and what that what what was it that you were accessing in order in order to become an actor? Uh, well, there's there's um, a myth amongst non-actors, right, that uh, acting is about lying or about pretending, mm -hmm. um, or that even the fact that you said that I had been trained as an actor in the underground, which is actually mm -hmm. not true at all, but, uh, right? right? Um, pretending is the furthest thing from acting, right? So acting is all about honesty and looking for the absolute truth in every moment. Right, uh, that you're on stage, right? And there is a way to do that, which is why you go through an intense, rigorous training in order to do that, mm -hmm. right? Which I'm not going to get into now because that would just come across as technical, uh, technical speak, right? Um, but yeah, the main thing about acting training is about uh, being able to access your most vulnerable self and your truest self. And the way to do that is to know yourself. Um, I could go on, but again, it won't make no, any no. sense. No, it does. Because, uh, uh, because but then I'd be talking about acting training, which is mm -hmm. not But good. But it's yeah. interesting that your most vulnerable mm -hmm. self is your truest self. Yes. So what does that, what does, why is that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think the answer is right there. I, w I would just be repeating myself, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, so how is it, because it's interesting, I think you're, I, I would agree that, that the assumption is that when someone is acting, they are pretending. They are not actually. Well, that, that, that I would call that amateur acting. Community <laughs> 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 theater. Uh -huh. Right, okay. Yeah. So how yeah. does, without that, this may be, this may be then overly technical, but, but how is it that one can be someone else and yet be true. You would have to go to theater school. Well, that's what I was talking about. Okay. There are many, many ways to get there, and there's an actual technique to get there, which you would actually have to go through. Yeah. Um, but it's one of those things where everybody thinks they're an actor, right? Everybody <laughs> thinks they can be an actor, uh -huh. just like everybody thinks they can be a writer, uh -huh. right? Uh, it, it's almost like there's a lack of respect for the craft that goes into acting and writing, right? People don't walk around saying, oh, everybody can be a, con you know, a, a concert violinist. It, for some reason, people understand that if they're watching like, you know, a, a concert violinist, that person has put years and years and years and years of work into training and, uh, and uh, practice, right? right? Yeah, same like if you're watching a ballet dancer or an opera singer. But interestingly, uh, people don't feel that way about acting or writing. It's like anybody can do that and everybody can do that. Well, there's that same, uh, Margaret yeah. Atwood very famously yeah. uh, spoke at a, well, she was at a cocktail party and someone said to her, oh, now what do you do? And she said, oh, well, I'm a writer. Uh, he was a brain surgeon. Uh, and he said, mm -hmm. so what do you do? I'm a writer. And he said, oh, is that a coincidence? When I retire, I want to be a writer. And she said, well, that is a coincidence. When I retire, I want to be a brain surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, Jordan, I'm, I'm yeah. interested in, well, I'd love to talk about that page at some sure. point. But before we get there, one of the fascinating uh, aspects of living in, I, I lived in Mexico for many years, and one of the fascinating aspects of living in Mexico was for me un learning to understand the intersection of myth and history in a place like Mexico. The two were actually uh, not just related, but intertwined, and historians would uh, refer to myth. It was as though an event would take place in real life, and then, and then before it fully landed, it would be, begin to become myth. And there was an acknowledgement of the, tr the deeper truth in myth, even, even among historians, which I found fascinating. And I began to try to make a similar understanding of, of story in, in First Nations cultures that we dismiss as you know, stories, that we don't honor the truth in those sorts of I don't even know the language to use, those sorts of stories, for lack of a better. Sure. So I'd just love to hear <coughs> how you see that, how you interpret that. Yeah, well, you know, I think uh, 
I, I guess I would, I guess I would start by saying, um, you know, in indigenous forms of of knowledge and and culture, in, including uh, you know, um, in, including like indigenous story works, you know, do have to work pretty hard to you know have to to get certain forms of credibility, I guess, uh, and. And, and I think that uh, I think that, like you know that generally comes from like a Western understanding of you know like pri privileging you know like writ written texts you know as like over over um, over oral texts and and, and I and you know and, and generally I, I think that uh, you know that like those indigenous knowledges are you know um, you know really um, Profoundly amazing, you know, and, and should be, uh, you know, at, at the forefront, you know, of, of a lot of indigenous thinking. That all being said, you know, I I I, I come at uh, my place of, of writing, you know, I think from a very different perspective and position. Um, in the in the in the latest uh, in my my latest work, you know, I talk a lot about uh, my position. Um, as both an intergenerational survivor of residential schools and an urban indigenous person, uh, and also you know a person, and it's like a a Niska person who um, grew up in an urban area with no um, no uh, like not being you know uh, in Niska territory and not having access to Niska knowledge and language and whatnot. You know, so 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 much of my work is actually about addressing what it means to uh, to be indigenous um, and how uh, and, and, and how indigenous peoples without uh, without you know like really kind of feeling connections to um, indigenous knowledges can proceed forward in the world. And so uh, can you just talk a little bit about the process of because for those people who don't know your work, it's quite interesting how you are excavating these original texts and then what you are doing to transform. Yeah. Uh, so in um, in in Injun, uh, which was my third book, um, I took uh, ninety one public domain Western novels and I compiled them um, and put them all in a single word document. Uh, that document ended up being over ten thousand pages long. Uh, and I, uh, for that book in particular, like I pulled out every single sentence that contained the word Indian, um, and then I kind of cut up and remixed those sentences together to form the basis of a long poem. Uh, so really, in, you know, working um, with settler colonial texts as material in order to comment on uh, the nature of of racism. And one of those pages has the word truth. It does, so yeah. <laughs> or one of the searches that you yes. did was on yeah. truth. And uh, can you, can you, can you uh, read from it or can we even just pass that around? Yeah, I, uh, to tell you truthfully, <laughs> I don't know how to read this page. Yeah, right. Uh, I, honestly, I, I don't. Um, but you, but I'll definitely okay. pass it around. Yeah. And you can take a look at it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so when you said, just final question, when you yeah. said, uh, before I move on to Daniel, uh, when you said, I don't often get asked to talk about truth, and there's a lot that I would like, when we, when we exchanged emails, there was, you said there was a lot that you had to say on the subject. Uh, what, what role does truth have? What does it play in your work? You know, I've been thinking about this all the time. Like, I've published, so I've published three books of poetry, uh, and, and poetry is wonderful. I, I love poetry as a category, but but for me, you know, I think you know, the the writing that I do is also nonfiction, you know, and 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 it, but it's also multi-genre writing. So like that that book that uh, is being passed around is a book of it's a book that uh, built out of fiction that kind of looks like poetry, uh, but to me, you know, it's nonfiction in the sense that it's very it's commenting very specifically. You know, on uh, on 
on the on the Western genre and on on textual racism, and I think you know uh, you, you like it speaks to to the uh, to the role that uh, that the Western has in our lives today. Yeah. Well, no, it's just so exciting because <laughs> because one of the things that I've been butting up against my whole writing life are these. I feel like I'm trying to swim in an ocean and I keep smashing into concrete walls that have been put there for, I can't figure out what purpose, for the purposes of, of shelving in bookstores or the purposes of library uh, numbers or, you know, I just can't figure out why this belongs over here and why this belongs over here. I remember actually in the midst of this crisis, I, was, I walked to a bookstore in Toronto and I thought, I'm going to sit in that aisle between fiction and nonfiction until I figure this thing out. And so I did a little sit-in, you know, I just sat in the, in the aisle. And would, I just looked at the books over here and looked at the books over here. And, so, and anyone whose history has been written about incorrectly or with a, a bias can perhaps feel the same way, that that book that's sitting so proudly and, and solidly in the nonfiction shelf is really, I just began to then pull books that I felt were in the gray area into this aisle until they asked me to leave. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to assemble what what is the, what are these books truly? And, and so if we could just then carry on right to Danielle, because one of the things I find fascinating is that within our own country, we do this differently. And so when I was on the um, jury of the Governor General's Awards for, for nonfiction a couple of years ago, the, the, the woman at the Canada Council who was overseeing our jury fell ill at the last minute. So someone from the French office stepped in. And she, in the break, Began, we began chatting, and she said, this is so interesting because in French, we do this completely differently. Half of the books that you call nonfiction in English, we don't in French. They would be, and so, yeah, that may be real. So can, can you just uh, fill us in about what, those, what that actually is, how, that, how it works in Quebec? Well, the genre is often, uh, you know, it's a way to, to, it's a craft in a sense, it gives you archetypes that you can work with or destroy or subsume, reconstruct. Uh, so it's one way to learn about patterns that exist in the culture, but uh, I would say in French, like they have this new category which I don't necessarily agree with, which is, they call it récit. For example, my last book, I would call it an essay in the pure sense of the word, the mocking sense of the word the word which would be a je, an I, you know, that is uh, looking at its own processes and uh, at its own consciousness and looking at the world at the same time and being in that alley between uh, the, the external and the internal and through language trying to create an, uh, a new vision of things in both fact and fiction. And I think, you know, books, labels are often it's, it's like a roadmap, right? Like it, it allows us to pinpoint things, but even any any work, I mean, evolves a form. If it's and it has to become autonomous at a point. It's not about the the work belonging to the author, but for me at least, it's, it's and I think that in the case of, of such processes as as you use and and this uh, uh, James Daniel Cooper like uh, regret. You, there is there is the idea somehow of uh, opening up the form to another life, to another, and and to me the, the book is a li it's a living form. It's not a, it's not something to trap uh, literature within and classify it. I mean there are different kinds of writing, but in, in terms of poetic writing, the kind of making I think, and you know I'll use this line. Like both the, the, the Greek roots for poiesis and the Latin roots for fiction, which are supposed to be different things, uh, they both point to making the fiction from some finger, and it means working with your ten fingers and shaping <laughs> something, which is not what people would think writing is. You know, they, even you talk to painters like, I am into the materiality. You are into materiality when you're working with sounds moving in air or thoughts moving through the nervous system, your body, your soul, your language. And poiesis, to me, it's almost a way to name uh, the fact that there's something rather than nothing, or there seems to be, and that's how we name it, we name it something. And poiesis is, is, the, is the root of all that. It's the way that the, 
the glove turns, you know, and, and disappears into the void. And so what is, what do you see as this realm between, you, you've talked about it as the realm between the real and the imagined, or the... It's all, for me, fiction is part of reality, just like writing is it's a fold inside reality. It's a way that, you know, you sat down to, to write your, your memoir or your whatever we want to call it, this book, and you sat down to, uh, to have a go at things. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and, and somehow these are both acts of shaping, you know, same as an invited to work with these people, we're going to shape something together and try to make it vibrate within the space of the real for however long it can, you know, wh whether it's the time of a reading or one month next to a group crystal, you know, and, and then these events are part of real time, they're part of space time and they, they're somehow like a, reshaping things, you know, reshaping the universe in a sense, yeah. even very humbly. <laughs> And yet we can understand, so those of us who do have uh, work in this, what's called memoir, there are, well, there are famous cases of being, people being taken to task for inventing and trying to pass off something. So the most famous case is James Frey, who tried to pass off his, um, well, he, the story is that he wrote a novel, <coughs> tried to shop it around, no one wanted it, and so his, so one of the editors who became ultimate said to him, you know, we could sell this as a memoir. If this is based on real events, we could really sell this as a memoir. So he was told to go back and rewrite it, take out the fictional elements, and, uh, and resubmit, which he did. But he didn't quite take out enough of the fictional elements. And after the book came out and was celebrated, people began to come out of the woodwork and say, you know, he wasn't actually in prison for three months. I was there for three hours, you know, which is which is beyond, uh, beyond artistic license, beyond exaggeration. And so there was a lot of debate about now the nonfiction police come out when you, when you uh, present a memoir and, and ensure that, fact, you know, that, that they can fact check certain elements, which is hugely important, of course. But did you run into that? And were you ever, because you worked in the terrain of theater, what was that process like for you? The memoir thing? Yeah. Oh, um, well, it's so funny because uh, often people ask me uh, if I um, exaggerated things in the memoirs or, or made them seem bigger than they were. And my answer is the opposite is true, right? Like I actually made it smaller than it was precisely to uh, avoid any, any, anything like what you're describing. I also uh, got a hold of everybody that I, that I mentioned in the memoir. It, it would never cross my mind to show them the writing because this goes back to what we said before. Everybody thinks they're a writer. Mm -hmm. And so everybody thinks they can give notes on writing, right? So I never showed them the writing, but I would tell them, like, just so you know, you're in this book and this is what I'm saying. Um, just to make sure that they knew that they were okay with it. Um, um, but yeah, so I kind, of, I kind of did the opposite. Like, I went back to each story and as we grow older, of course, we start to change stories, right? We start to mythologize them. Mm -hmm. So I did the opposite. Like, I went back to all the stories, and I looked at all the mythology around each story, and I got rid of all the mythology, and just went back to the original story as much as I possibly could. Like, really getting very clear, okay, which part of this is mythologized, get rid of it. Uh -huh. uh, and even so, after the book came out, Everybody in my family came and, and privately corrected the entire book for me. <laughs> and of course, interestingly, which of course I haven't told them because I think it would crush each one of them, um, each one of their corrections was completely, completely different than the other one, right? Like, literally, like the opposite in some cases, right? Yeah. But completely con convinced that their, their version was the absolute truth. Yeah. 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 And so what, uh, so what is, how do we navigate this? Because we are in a, we are in t a time when, uh, when facts are losing value in, in public discourse or in, in certain uh, arenas, and, and, and yet it's never been more crucial to understand what is true, what really happened. No, we, it's, it's in 
immensely important to fact check and ensure that we're communicating the right information. And yet that doesn't, that seems to be, uh, it seems to be a flawed process, or it seems to be a process that can, can be uh, corrupted very easily. And so what, how do we, how do we navigate this time? Can art help us navigate a what's now being, in, uh, is it Yuval Noah Harari in his book, um, Sapiens, talks about a post, we are in a post-truth age. And, uh, that, and that, that human beings are unique in that we create these fictions amongst ourselves that become true when we believe them, um, which is an interesting notion. But So I'd just love to, you're nodding, yeah, I'd love to. Uh, just jumping on to that thought, um, I was ju just uh, in a conversation uh, before we got up here, I was thinking about uh, uh, Michelle Foucault has this essay uh, on Robert Arthur Lecky's work, uh, uh, Lecky with a small book called uh, Porcupines and China Dolls, and it's about um, his, his experiences in, uh, well, it, it, it's a fictional book about residential schools, but it's very much an autobiographical book um, in which, uh, in which, like, a lecky, like, um, addresses and uh, an attempts to deal with his experiences through fiction. Um, and and I, I'm, I'm thinking about this book in the context of this discussion about, uh, or in this, like, specifically about uh, post-truth post and, and ink, that, that it's a, it, it's a work that, that speaks to, it speaks to truth through fiction, and, poten and potentially, like, you know, the, the argument that people make is that uh, it's, like, that Alecki's work um, can, can, that, like, he's only able to access mm -hmm. this truth through, through fiction, fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, you know, it's, uh, and that that's an important aspect of it. You yeah. know, yeah. so I, so I, so I wonder, you know, what that, what that means. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wonder too. Yeah. It makes me think of a lot of cases, you know, like, uh, I worked um, with the, the, the actress and the director, Marc Brassard, on a play called The Invisible, which is, uh, came here, I think. It was about J.K. Leroy. I don't know if you remember the J.K. Leroy case, which was basically that uh, this middle-aged uh, um, Californian writer uh, created the, the persona of this, uh, like, about 12-year-old trans uh, prostitute. And this person was played by her sister in real life. And he became, he, she <laughs> became friends with all these celebrities. And uh, they were photographed with him, or they were they, they were bragging about the, the relationship they had uh, with uh, JT and all that. And then when people discovered that uh, the fiction was real, that is that somebody had acted uh, the character of the author, they were they felt betrayed, completely betrayed. Their trust in fiction was destroyed by the fact that this was not a, a true fiction. <laughs> a fictional fiction. And what this points to is that all these arguments are completely emotional. When you talk about post-truth, post-anything, and that's, that's like the label on top of the book. It's like it means that the magazine has something dramatic to say this yeah. month about the end of something or other. <laughs> or a whole periscope field is being built around an upcoming apocalypse of some sort. <laughs> so in these, uh, these dramatic formulas, they, in a way, they, they bear their own truth, which is this idea of wanting to solve it all and to know where the story is going and say, okay, the world is ending so we can behave in a different way. And, you know, and they help us. They, they become like these uh, fields of energy. They help us and they hinder us at the same time. And I think that... Uh, but be careful with the notion such as truth and untruth because it carries fiction or poetry, the poesis or the, the making into the realm of logic. And the, it's really the interface between logic is one thing, tells us the syntax, the grammar, but then we start playing with it and something happens. And, and it's in this making that something manifests that is true to life. 
and that is not true to some kind of structural system or illustration of something that passes as fact. And I believe in certain facts. For example, if the roof was to fall in, we would have to weather that fact physically. <laughs> and and these, these, this to me is the realm of fact in a certain sense. And I, th I think I'll tell another, I'll stop after the examples, but uh, <coughs> one of my favorite books ever is uh, The Cinnamon Store, which is translated as uh, Street of Crocodiles in English, uh, by Bruno Schulz, who died uh, in the very village uh, where, the very town where he grew up. It was transformed to a ghetto by the Nazis and then shot in the air there at age 51. And uh, he wrote a sort of imaginary autobiography of living in this place, almost as if time was reaching out through fiction to create a sort of escape tunnel from the situation in which he became trapped. So he creates a transfiguration of the place where he comes from, like maybe a bit, I haven't read the book you were referring to, The Porcupine and the China Doll. But it, fiction creates an entanglement or a, a sort of hope, in a sense, and, and this hope then travels through time, and it does not make the author survive, but it makes something of that feeling survive and cross through time, and creates a bridge with the dead, in a certain sense. Oh. And it creates its great, a, a, a book that works, it creates its own myth, it creates its own opening into a, a sort of beyond, a portable paperback beyond. <laughs> so do you think we have greater, do you think we can access truth more readily through <coughs> through the imagination, through through invention. I, I guess I'm curious to know your your experience, the difference in your experience between writing, because you've written autobiographical theater, mm -hmm. which which had the liberty, no one is going to be fact checking your play as it goes on. So and and you've written memoir in which you were rigorous about the research and the way things were presented. Were those two uh, exercises markedly different, or did they feel like explorations in the same territory? Well, I think because even if you're writing memoir or autobiographical theater, um, it, 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 you're still using your imagination completely, right? Um, because what you're doing is you're actually writing Right, as opposed to just recounting a series of events, which is not writing, right? Is you are uh, using themes and you are in conversation with those themes, and that takes imagination, right? You have uh, super objectives for the characters. You have you place them in conflict. Um, you have counter themes. So all of that takes imagination and it takes rigor and endurance, uh, which is what writing is, right? So even if you are uh, the content that you are reaching for is quote unquote true, right? Because it's memoir. Uh, you are still creating uh, a story, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, thematically, for example, or stylistically, um, as opposed to just recounting events, which is not memory, as far as I'm concerned, right? Um, I, don't, I don't remember what your question was, but. No, <laughs> that's <laughs> uh, Yeah, wait, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, so speaking of imagination, I question about it. So the imagination, like, it seems like kind of dangerous mental tool, like, uh, I want the old, because the de very definition is like, uh, bending the, the reality, but on the other hand, can be used to, to discover the truth. So I wonder, when does it try to, when, when does it become useful to discover the truth, or, or when, when does it become, uh, become a, 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 like a, a twist of the truth? So I ask this question, um, Stemming from uh, my, the impression I had uh, by uh, viewing Daniel's work, uh, both Tuesday and today, um, his work, Daniel's work, gives me a kind of consistent impression about uh, the kind of creative imagination, creativity that he has, also the relationship that he relates to the imagination. So first of all, first of all, the, his imagination is wild and exuberant, like creating a country, the, the chase game between eraser and controller. So. Uh, also, when imagination becomes so like uh, ridiculous, quote unquote, uh, then it's very, it's very, uh, then it's, it has a risk uh, of, of uh, drawing <coughs> attention to the imagination itself. But 
for the for instance, you say audience leads leads the leads the show performance and say ah oh, and and if if that audience says ah oh, that that was very creative, somehow I feel like uh, mm. okay, that that audience failed a little because he draws the attention from the word itself to the to this very abstract abstract thing that we call imagination. But then you know, of course the the other way, why would being very ridiculous? Uh, 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 somehow I feel very grounded. Yeah. Um, so, I will, uh, it's, so for me, it feels like uh, it's very, uh, he's, he's using imagination very casually, as if that's the normal way that he thinks. It's as if it's his, his weapon that he uses every day to think through everyday questions. Uh, so I wonder why I have that feeling, or what, or what about his work that, that actually works. So my um, guess is that, like, because he, he sees the Daniel's, uh, it's, for him it's, a, it's his everyday tool to, to see a legal problem because of the utility and that, and, and that his imagination is like his weapon to blow, blow off the context of a problem and then re re replace, a new, replace a new context and then somehow this new context makes the audience um, see a different, like, the true nature of the agent like, in the previous context. So that was my guess. So, but I would like to hear Daniel or uh, you talk about why imagination works. Well. I think it's you bring it back also to what, to, uh, what the TV but if there's one thing that resonates, I think ridiculous the compliment, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I also think that uh, there's an idea of, the, of right, the right to the imagination, because what I did in that class that uh, they're having a hard time in these French immersion classes, you know, and it, they want to learn. They want to have a way of navigating the new space that they're in. And some of them were, back, you know, were more uh, advanced than others. But this, I was giving them this, this right that they already had. I wasn't giving it to them. I was like, I was telling them, you have this right. You know, it kind of makes fun of this and parts and you can make something together. and and, and it, you know, you're sampling James Fenimore Cooper, you, you're you navigating in the excerpt you read through the system of the LA airport, and it's about finding ways through structures and narratives that are imposed to us, or that have been layered inside the experience that we're living, and somehow finding why, you know, you feel good at the LA, you know, airport, or why there's this beauty to James Fenimore Cooper, because I feel it, and, you know, and, and what, how you can reach out to this, you know, figure that, that's like a, a sort of a pre symbolic oppressor, you know. Sure. So it's, it's this, this idea of right that people have and that they, maybe this is con condescending, but uh, I don't think so. For me it's hopeful. It's like they, they're capable, maybe, maybe not, but they have the right to do it, you know, and take on what they <coughs> I'd like to, to raise the issue of cultural appropriation, which we've all been heard so much about and thought so much about recently. And um, when I read the Arenda, I was blown away by it. And then there was the whole issue of Joseph Gordon and his background. And, you know, did that change the way I felt and, and 
person who I am a socialist. Um, uh, so I approach a lot of work from the point of view of labor. Uh, in Canada, uh, the Canadian National Equity Association raised numbers say that in the professional theater world in Canada, uh, of all the people that we see on stage, only 3.7% are, are women of color. And that of that 3.7%, almost none in lead roles. So as far as I'm concerned, if you're going to put on a play, for example, right, of, uh, where um, three out of the five characters are Latinx, let, let might as well, even if it's just for a labor, in terms of labor, might as well give that work to three Latinx actors, right? This might sound really obvious. Incredibly, it's not. Right? Incredibly, it's not. Like, it was not that long ago we had to have this. There was a huge uproar in Vancouver, like a couple years ago, because that did not happen. And there was a massive argument as to how it was okay for a white woman to be playing the lead uh, in a play um, where the lead character was a Latina woman, right? And so for me, I always just, if anything, just go back to the labor. Right? It, it's a labor issue. Who's getting the work? Why are they getting the work? And why do we have to keep arguing that it, if there are almost no plays being presented in Canada, for example, where the lead role is a Latina, um, might as well give it to a Latina actor and actually give her some work. Not to mention that she will probably bring something to the role that the white actor, no matter how good she is, won't. Right? Um, so I just thought I would say that while you were exploring the idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, agree, I agree with what, what yeah. you were saying there. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, to, to bring it back um, to, to voiding in that question of uh, cultural appropriation, I would, I would definitely say, you know, it, I, I, I think in that particular case, and it's worth, I think, looking at those particular cases and, and like, and addressing each one individually. Um, you know, I think he took up, he took up so much space. He, he took up so much space that, and that, and, and that space, you know, I think really could be used more productively to, you know, celebrate indigenous authors. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't think his work is worth returning to after all of that. And, and, you know, I, I, and I also, you know, I don't really see it as um, an attack on imagination at all. And, and in, that, in that case, like, I think framing imagination, you know, as also kind of maybe being synonymous with, like, free speech is kind of, is kind of troubling. Um, and, you know, and that, that being said, you know, I do think it's worth, uh, it's worth it's worth celebrating. Um, it, it, it's worth celebrating indigenous voices. It's worth celebrating, you know, work that. Uh, oh, did you? Uh, oh, I'm just yeah. gonna jump in. Also, like Grove Street was a building council. I don't know what his work was. You sure. know, in some in some respects. And it, it's like sort of troubling to me how much like um, the conversation around truth. You know, there's this implicit association that that there's a positive or empirical truth that we can get at. And that um, you know, when, when the issues of cultural appropriation come up, it all seems linked to the idea of empirical truth as tied to property. And um, I think it's really important to mention how how uh, how many um, writers composed for indigenous often use their work in order to gain property. And he is one sure. one instance of, of he's he's one of these writers, and there's another guy named. Uh, somebody who claimed to go to the Indian, uh, the Kansas State Indian University too in the 70s in the United States. And, you know, it's not just a question of art, it's a question of um, capital. Like, yes, sir. you know, um, anyway, I just had to. It's going to jump in. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Thank you. I have a filler. Thank you. 
wanted to become the popular as opposed to the negative narration, you know, and the hope as opposed to the fear. Your answer? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, I think there's many binaries in this discussion. You know, it's much truth, like when I think of, you know, since she said I studied philosophical science, she's thinking of models for like, you know, fact-based empirical practices and that truth, the truth value of a statement, you know, and the truth value of a, a measurable fact and stuff like that. And I think we're much more dealing with, with nuances and, and continuums and, and colors, but it's more about when a work becomes massively public and a, a public property and a public uh, object like uh, Mr. Boyden's uh, work, it becomes an image of itself also, and then this is what you're dealing with in addition to the actual work. And I think a lot of these, these books, and maybe I'm, I'm wrong, there are publishers in the room, but <coughs> uh, the, a lot of these books that have this huge like, uh, public impact also, the, they are not necessarily read with a lot of application because the story that will function in the public space it has to be simpler than the stories that actually you'll get from actually going to a place Actually, watching Citizen Kane, actually, uh, actually uh, reading a book uh, from start to finish and involving yourself with it, and so we shouldn't believe that literature should be reduced to that image in the public space, mm -hmm. and that is where writers like they don't take their, their courage, I think, uh, for myself, but in the in the public space, they take it in the relationship to the work of language itself, to the work of story or poetry or and I think this is what you're supposed to defend and it's a magic trick literature you know you can be a complete asshole and write wonderful things <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's there's a the, also the moral value it's more about this what core field is set in motion by all this and it's hard it's hard to judge work from these these basis but the story I want to tell her is that in Australia you know a, 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 a kind of a country with a very violent uh, history, and uh, the other modernist poets in the 30s that didn't exist. And he was the greatest po new modern poet in the nation. And basically, <laughs> these two literary critics from England made him up. And he became uh, the T.S. Eliot of the Australian <laughs> man. And then when they found out that uh, he didn't exist, same thing happened as with G.C. Leroy. So we want fiction to be fiction. I just want to say something go back to your question about cultural appropriation. I, I, I think that the, the, the terminology that I would use is, is cultural misappropriation, which is a different thing. So uh, I agree that, and maybe this is a very unpopular thing to say, that anybody can write about anything. I truly, truly agree with that. Not necessarily well. <laughs> yes, but I agree with Brad Fraser. I absolutely agree with him, 100%. And the, the thing is for me is know what you write. Right? So, uh, what do I mean by that? I'll give you an example. Like right now, I've been commissioned to write, uh, to, um, how do you say that, uh, adapt a um, Medea, Euripides Medea. So, what I'm doing is I'm setting Medea in 1980 on Kingsway in Little Saigon, and all the characters will be Vietnamese refugees. I'm not Vietnamese. I'm a refugee, but I'm not Vietnamese. It could be argued that I'm, I should not be writing that because I'm not Vietnamese, right? Uh, but for me, there is um, uh, a collab it's, it's about collaboration. So what I'm doing is I'm getting involved with the Vietnamese community as of now, getting as many of them involved in the process as possible. Um, so that would be called research, right? Research takes on many, many, many different forms. Right? Um, I'm doing all kinds of research, and one of the key pieces of research that I'm doing is uh, getting the Vietnamese community involved in this project immediately. Right? Uh, I think it's cultural misappropriation. It would be cultural misappropriation if I was to do this play and never talk to a single Vietnamese person <laughs> and never get them involved, and then on top of it, cast a play with non-Vietnamese actors. That would be like an absolute lack of respect and cultural misappropriation. But what we're aiming to do is to cast it with Vietnamese actors, with Vietnamese Canadian actors, 
have a cultural consultant in the room from the Vietnamese community during the entire rehearsal process, but in that way, it's a collaboration, right? Um, so yes, I agree with Brad Fraser that anybody can write anything, and you need to uh, represent, uh, present yourself honestly. So I actually don't know what Hoyden's background is, but if he was misrepresenting himself as indigenous, that is a problem. Uh, do I think that it's bad that he wrote books um, about uh, indigenous experiences? I don't. I don't think so. Um, I think that the problem, and I, I agree with you, that each, each one has to be taken individually, right? Um, the, from what I understand, the problem with, with his work is not the work itself, but it's how he misrepresented himself. Um, Jordan, did you yeah. want to add something? Yeah, no, I, I just wanted, wanted to jump in and uh, I, I just agree with what you're, what you're saying. Um, and, I, and I think you can frame it as a problem of accountability, too, yeah. or as an issue of accountability. Anybody can write anything, but if you write something, you know, about, uh, you know, about an indigenous nation, for example, and, and you know, they, 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 I think you need to be accountable to that nation. Um, and, and, and I think that's really where uh, Hoyden's work, you know, fell apart. Um, and, you know, I was, you know, uh, like, like in, uh, in Urenda, for example, when he talks, with, when he writes a book with the Shoshone people, uh, I was, I was in a room in Six Nations where Haudenosaunee people were, you know, like, it, with Joseph Boyd when they were asking him, you know, like, or they they were telling him that you know they didn't feel represent, <coughs> like well represented, and that uh, and that this was not um, a representation that they were comfortable with, and and Boyd's response was disinterest mostly. Um, and I think that's like a fine like you know, and I think you know really it, 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 I think it's very true that that's a problem of accountability or or lack thereof. There's an escape velocity from dialogue, actually. When you get to a point where you, you, you have a certain amount of, a, of celebrity or power or uh, property over the public space, you don't need to have a dialogue. You need to, but you you feel like it, like <coughs> you won't mention anybody here, like in positions <laughs> of power. But uh, this is a cheapening of the public narrative, and we have to resist that. That's like kind of the job of the the socialist, the labor movement, yeah. the people trying to uh, find voices in time. And uh, so I think, you know, this, this idea that somehow you can own silence, the silence of others, is, is kind of what's happening a lot in the world. Okay. Uh, I well, think we have so one question. Um, in the back, just to comment on this, on this same issue. Um, so uh, this reminds me of something that happened a long time ago. Um, when the film Gone with the Wind was produced, uh, there was a lot of uh, fuss about whether or not the portrayal by the actor Paddy McDaniel of the black maid of Scarlet O'Hara was uh, the right thing to have done. And on the one hand, you had um, the NAACP, remember this was a very long time ago, uh, saying, well, it was a disgrace the way that, you know, the black was being portrayed in this film. Um, and this was at a time when, you know, she was, she was the first black to ever win an Oscar for her performance for this, for this uh, work. Um, so they forced her to sit in the back of the room. Clark Gable walked out. He was a very good friend of hers, and he refused everything to do with the Oscars because of this. Um, so, uh, but the response of Hattie McDaniel, she said two things. One, she said, I'd rather be earning $700 an hour playing a maid than $7 a week being one. And then she said, and the other thing she said was, but that's how it was. In other words, it was a true portrayal of the way things were. And it seems to me that this discussion of cultural misappropriation uh, often loses, and I think I agree with you, often loses sight of the fact that the author may actually be simply trying to tell the truth. And who cares whether they, you know, it's like when you go to Israel and they tell you, you, have, you are not allowed to comment on the situation of the Palestinians because you're not an Israeli. You know, it's like it's basically
drawing lines and saying, you know, you're not a frog bird, because you're not one of us. Which is obviously wrong. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. No, oh, no, there's just a light here. I don't see it. I have a very quick comment of taking off on the whole force field. I spent uh, quite a lot of time, a lot of time listening into the use of violence in art and all ramifications about having portrayals of violence in art. And I went all the way down the rabbit hole. And at the end of the day, I came across uh, a very short statement by Tolstoy, which, you know, being Tolstoy, I was like, darn, I spent all this work in Tolstoy wrapped it up in a bunch of <laughs> so basically, to referring to moral force, but basically what Tolstoy said is, art should cause violence to be set aside. So say that again? Art, art should cause violence to be set aside. So he doesn't make any judgment about whether there's violence in art or there's no violence in art or anything else. He just talks about the outcome of your use. So art should cause violence to be set aside, not that there shouldn't necessarily be violence in art, but that the result of your using of violence in art is that it should be set aside. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we will end on that note. If you'd like to continue the discussion uh, individually with any of our guests, please join us next door for reception. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you again and I'll see you in